but I'm going to uh, hand over to my colleagues to talk about the Scots in Great War London group. Uh, it's a group of Scottish organisations which have come together to mark the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I. I'm from St Columba's Church, uh, Pont Street. The minister, the Reverend Angus MacLeod, it was his idea, uh, it was his energy that got it going. Unfortunately, um, no fault of his own, he's stuck on a train somewhere south of Berwick uh, because of a derailment. And if anyone wants to use that line, there is trouble ahead, I'm afraid. Um, but I'm going to introduce three colleagues uh, who will talk briefly about the organisations they represent, um, and then we'll throw it open to questions. The, the role of St Columbus was to uh, feed and sometimes accommodate 50,000 Scottish troops coming to and from the front line. They would come through London and uh, elders of the church, members of the church, would meet them at Victoria Station and provide them with uh, food and uh, uh, a means of getting in contact with their families at home. It's a very moving story, and it's part of a book which we're producing, uh, which my colleagues will tell you about. So, first of all, I'm going to ask Paul McFarland, who is the Secretary of London Scottish FC, that's the rugby club, for those of you who don't know, to talk about his organisation's involvement, uh, and then uh, our two colleagues. So, Paul, over to you just for a few minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. Um, hope you can all hear me. Can you hear me at the, at the back? OK. Bad luck. Um, <laughs> So the rugby club, London Scottish Rugby Club, is what you expect it to be, is a rugby club. The First World War came, and already by that stage, most of the players were either serving in the London Scottish Regiment, which was a territorial regiment, and it was the first volunteer regiment to see active service as early as October 1914. Uh, and other uh, members of the club were also professional soldiers. They'd often trained at the Royal Academy in Woolwich or at... Sandhurst, and it was not untypical for a Scots boy or young man to come from Edinburgh, Glasgow, other cities in Scotland, down to London to serve in the army or down to London to work in banks and finance, just as they do now. There were 90,000 Scots living and working in London in August 1914. Um, and they also came down to universities, um, particularly to uh, Oxford and Cambridge. Um, and it was a very high incidence of Oxbridge Blues also playing for the rugby club. But the statistics are extraordinary because the club had a very strong association with Scotland, uh, Scotland Rugby. The Calcutta Cup match in April 1914, March 1914, featured five players from the club and five ex-players from the club, and six of those men would be killed within two years of war starting. Altogether, uh, 87 international rugby players from the four countries, that's England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland, were killed. Of those 87, 31 were Scots. That's completely disproportionate. Scotland's a tenth of the population of the UK. It's more than a third of the international rugby players killed. And of those 31, 20 played for my club. Which again is completely disproportionate. But they were the kind of man who went to war straight away when war was first declared. and. They were mostly officers, not all, but also little known fact is that a, the proportion of men killed from the ranks was lower than the proportion of officers killed. We all think of, oh, what a lovely war, and um, mm. you know, the, uh, the, the lions led by donkeys. Well, the donkeys were often the ones who got killed first, um, the, the officers themselves. So the rugby club has got a very, very close relationship with the war. We have a war memorial at the club, 103 names on it. And the players today walk past that war memorial on their way to the dressing rooms. And they absolutely buy into the history. So our involvement in this project has been very exciting for the club to be involved in a project with all the other Scottish organisations. And many Scotsmen would be members of the Rugby Club, the Caledonian Club. They would worship at one of the two churches. So a lot of commonality of interest between the various groups. And the project has brought us all together, which has been very good. But I, I personally found my own part, writing the chapter on the rugby club and the research I had to do and learning about some of these incredibly brave young men who went and did what we hope to God people don't have to go and do again. So that was us. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, so I'm now going to ask Sheena Tate uh, from Crown Court Church, Covent Garden, to talk about uh, Crown Court's role in the project and also the, a little bit, of, little bit about the church's role in World War I. Well, Crown Court is the oldest surviving Church of Scotland church in London. There's only two of us at the moment. Two? Yeah, two of us at the moment. But Crown Court's story focuses on 
the people in Crown Court's War Memorial, who were mostly the soldiers rather than the officers, in common with a lot of villages in Scotland, there were family groupings where all the sons were killed. There was, like Paul said, we've got the typical bankers, bakers, lawyers, all the Scots who came down to London to further <coughs> their careers. There's a lot of interesting stories. There's some daring do tales we've got one young man who single ca single-handedly captured 500 german soldiers and marched them back to the british lines but one of the most touching stories is about somebody who wasn't even a member of crown court he's not on our war memorial he doesn't appear in any of the crown court papers but he did leave his copy of the st john's gospel behind when he came to worship at the church one Sunday before he embarked for France. And we found this copy of St John's Gospel, or our session clerk found it, on Christmas morning when he was getting the communion vessels out ready for the service. Small Bible, white cover, with a coat of arms in the front, and inside was the soldier's name, his number and his regiment. So we decided we'd try and find out more about this man, who he was, what had happened to him. We discovered he was called Samuel Small. He was English. He'd emigrated to Canada in about 1912, had married over there, and then had enlisted in the New Brunswick Regiment at the start of the war. Had been shipped over to Britain, for training and then went over to France and was killed in 1916. We got that basic information <coughs> and we <coughs> thought we need to try and find some family at least to give the Bible back to. And we'd done some basic research online. We discovered it had three children. The youngest of them was married in the 1930s. So we thought, there's no way there's going to be any children left alive. It's going to be grandchildren, great nieces, great nephews, things like that. And we got that far and more or less run out of online records. And then the session clerk went on holiday to France. And while he was there, he visited the Canadian Memorial at Vimy Ridge and got talking to one of the young Canadian guides who was there explaining the Canadians' involvement with World War I. And Alan told him the story about finding the Bible, about doing the basic research and about hoping to be able to return the Bible to a member of the family. And the guy said, well, that's very interesting, you know, where did this guy come from? New Brunswick, said Alan. That's where I'm from, said the guide. So his advice was to contact the local New Brunswick newspaper and um, see if they'd publish a letter telling the story to see if anybody would recognise the name to see if we could find family to return the Bible. Once Alan was home, he wrote to the editor of the newspaper and not only, not only were they enthusiastic about the story, they wanted to turn it into a full article did some more historical research based on records in New Brunswick and Canada, and published double page spread all about Private Samuel Small and his Bible being found in a Scottish church in London. The response was overwhelming. The newspapers inundated with letters from people who knew the family, who knew relatives, but the most intriguing letter was from somebody who said, can you send us the Bible? I want to show it to Auntie Annie. And it turns out that Auntie Annie was Sam Private Small's youngest daughter who was still alive. This was back in 2010. She was still alive. She was living in a nursing home in New Brunswick and she remembered her father going off to war. So of course, We've got to send the Bible back, but it seemed a bit too impersonal just, you know, putting it in an envelope and sticking it in the post. 
but there'd been so much interest generated that we actually managed to arrange for the local MP to present the Bible to Annie on the anniversary of our mother's death, I think it was. So in the book is the whole story. Mm. We've got a picture of Private Small's youngest daughter receiving her father's Bible back from the local MP. And Annie Andrews actually died nine months after we'd managed to return her father's Bible to her. So it was really heartwarming to be able to be involved in that project mm. and to tell the story and to be able to help in getting the Bible back to Samuel Small's daughter. Thank you very much, Sheila. Um, that was wonderful. Um, David, just a few words on the Caledonian Club uh, and their involvement. Uh, yeah, thank you, Hugh. Um, those among you who are observant will notice I'm wearing my club tie. And uh, somebody said to me, I see two X's and a V, 25. What does that mean? I said, uh, well, that's my age. <laughs> she didn't believe me. <laughs> but the Caledonian Club has been running in London for quite a long time, over, well over 100 years. And it was founded, of course, for the Scots who'd come to London. Of course, many people say, why are all these Scots in London? The answer, of course, is, you know, somebody has to run things. <laughs> but the Caledonian Club uh, started out as a gentleman's club in, in London. But I'm very pleased to say in recent times it's now an equal members club, so ladies are equally invited in to the bar to buy us a drink as well as us buying them a drink. But this was a great uh, project that came together through Angus MacLeod and the rest of us of these ten organisations in London, all of whom were operational during the First World War. Uh, in fact, in 2007, uh, sorry, 1917, the Caledonian Club had a difficult problem because the owner it was owned in these days, had died. And the Duke of Athol, who was a member of the club, he was chairman at the time, took up the uh, appeal to get money to buy the club. So in, in 1917, and we just celebrated last year the, uh, the anniversary of the club. 2017 was a difficult year for the club. Not only was the problem of ownership, but by that time we had lost 169 members. As Paul said earlier, surprisingly to some, the proportion of officers killed was higher than enlisted men. And of course, what we had as members was many, many young subalterns who had come down from Scotland with their regiments to fight. There's a great story in the book about one young subaltern who came down, went out to join his regiment at the Western Front, and was introduced to his colonel who said, uh, Aye, laddie, good you're here, and you're a member of the Caledonian Club. To which the lad said, well, no. So the colonel said, well, you know, I'll be quite happy to propose you. So the subaltern thought about it for a minute and said, um, well, if you don't mind, sir, I'll wait a wee while to take up your offer. And of course, he knew the rate wasn't good for him. But that same man lived for 60 years afterwards and sat at the end of the bar in the Caledonian Club regaling young members with the stories <laughs> of the First World War. Uh, so it's a great place to come if you're in London, but the book brings all this together, and it really is a fascinating book. So please, take a leaflet, buy the book. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much there, David Coffrey there, Vice President of the Caledonian Club. So as described, the flyer that some of you will have got describes the book. It's being published at the end of June. I'm sure it's available at a good uh, bookshop near you or online. Uh, we have HRH, the Princess Royal, as the patron of our group. Uh, she's been very supportive. Uh, we have a big event at St Columbus on October the 20th um, to mark in readings and music the work done by the church looking after these 50,000 soldiers coming to and from uh, Scotland, being looked after in London. Uh, the Caledonian Club has a lecture by Professor Gary Sheffield uh, at the beginning of October. Uh, 2nd of October. 2nd of October. Uh, London Scottish uh, FC has an event, uh, TBA, a commemorative mm -hmm. match. And uh, I must take an opportunity with Crown Court to tee up the tercentenary next year. Yes, I was just going to mention that if you hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> so there's lots going on for any of you uh, in London uh, wanting to come to any of these events or, or visit our organisations. And um, there's a chance now to ask a few questions to uh, any of us, should you wish to do so. So over to you and I'll hand over the mic.
Silence reigns. <laughs> I was wondering which other organisations are involved of the ten. Well, the main ones, the two churches, Crown Court and uh, St Columbus, um, two regiments, the London Scottish Regiment, which is the volunteer regiment, and the Scots Guards, who are the Scots, the professional soldiers based down in London. Um, the Royal Caledonian Society Royal of London, which is yep. over 200 years old. Yep. Scots Care, which is over 400 years old and was yep. founded when... Uh, um, James VI of Scotland went down to London to assume the throne of the United Kingdom and became James I. Um, and sorry? sorry? There's also the Royal Caledonian Educational Trust, Trust, which used to be the Caledonian schools and used to educate the children of Scottish servicemen. They are now turned into a grant-giving organisation but still support yeah. the children of Scottish servicemen. And... And also the, the promote their the, causes, yeah. um, mm. offer them grants to help with education or to help with um, extra extracurricular yeah. courses they might want to do. There's the Burns Club of London. Mm. Yeah. Um, what else? Is that 10 yet? I think that's, I well think that's about 10. <laughs> I, I should have added that the um, Royal Caledonian Education Trust uh, is bringing uh, an acclaimed uh, theatrical work down to London. Yeah. It's been performed widely in Scotland, uh, highlighting issues facing um, service families in, in mm. modern day life. So that's being performed to local schools in London. Mm. Uh, it'll be a really exciting event. Uh, that again is, yeah. I think it's October the 18th is the date. So uh, that'll be an important part of our the and, event. Well. And some of the groups got together because what they wanted to do was to look after, obviously if you're the regiments or the rugby club, everybody went. With the rugby club, there just was no rugby for five years. But for those who stayed in London, it's what, it was what they did on the home front to support the soldiers who were gone. And for a while, the groups got together as a federated council of Scottish organizations, and they did things like knit and all things you expect people to do. And they sent socks, they sent food. There's a wonderful story of um, one of my predecessors as club secretary um, was a prisoner of war for two years. It's bizarre, you forget how close London is to Europe even before Eurotunnel. He was home on leave in Farnham uh, in, in Wimbledon rather, had breakfast at home, uh, was driven to Farnham, got on a plane to go back to saint Omer where he was meant to be based, brand new pilot, got lost, landed over enemy lines by mistake and had dinner as a prisoner of war. So had breakfast, <laughs> had breakfast with his wife and dinner as a POW with yeah. the Germans. Anyway, he told us a wonderful story about all the food and so on coming in, the haggis that was sent for Halloween and so on. And he said at one point, one of the prison camps he was in, the Germans increased the guard on the camp, not to keep the prisoners of wars in, but to keep the villagers who were starving in, <laughs> with no rations in a German village out of the prisoner of war camp because the prisoners were better fed, thanks to the Scottish organisation sending food, <laughs> than the German villagers were uh, that, that where the camp actually was. So these old days, is an extraordinary job looking after the Scots soldiers, but all soldiers who were, who were there. And, of course, London was much closer to the war than you were here. Yeah. London was bombed in the First World War, you forget, by Zeppelins and by, by, by Wombers. Sorry. F fascinating to hear about um, this uh, retrospective uh, project and uh, all of the extraordinary stories that it's bringing to light. Uh, will it, do you think, uh, inspire any future initiatives that will arise out of the shared experience? Well, there was a, an attempt about um, seven, eight, nine years ago to bring all the Scottish organisations in London together under one umbrella. And um, for various reasons, it didn't quite succeed. Although there's commonality, as it was mentioned, many of us are members of a number of organisations. What this has done, interestingly, among these 10 organizations, because we work very closely together over these past uh, months, a you know, year in fact, I think we're going to now have an umbrella organization in London that brings all these Scottish organizations together. One opportunity through the internet to go in and find them all together. And you can actually through the book anyway, because it lists them all, gives all the information. And I think that's a great um, uh, benefit that's come out of that. The so legacy of this of this program in this book. Another possibly more tangible 
benefit that's coming out of it is as part of this project, St Columbus Church magazines are going to be digitised because they effectively tell a lot of the story of the London home front during the First World War and also the um, London Scottish Regiment journals are going to be digitised as well. And I believe Angus is trying to organise a course for church members about how to research their local history using things like war memorials and local journals, local magazines to find out more about the ordinary people who don't normally get their stories told during that period. I, I was just interested in the St. Columbus connection, actually, because I know that it all kind of... I was wondering if we could get a slight picture of how... what was happening in St. Columbus and the soldiers that... I, I don't exactly know the story, but I'm interested in what the background was. I don't know if anyone knows any more about that. That's a, a good point. I'll just get away from the speaker, because there tends to be um, feedback. Um, so, basically, the, the magazines, as Sheena was saying, <coughs> reveal this astonishing story of a church sort of coming together and being quite gung-ho to begin with and su supporting the war effort and sending off, um, you know, knitted woolens to the, to the front line and then discovering that the Scottish troop trains, uh, the, the regiments would come back and arrive at Victoria at two in the morning. And of course the trains north to Glasgow, Edinburgh, Inverness, whatever, wouldn't leave till 11 o'clock or midnight. So they literally had nothing to do. A day of their precious leave was wasted, whereas the English troops could probably get home quite quickly. So the church would send out volunteers at two in the morning to look for Scottish troops arriving, often with mud all over their kilts, literally just out of the front line, and take them back in various share banks and, and whatever to St. Columbus. And this work starts from just five or six Scottish soldiers they literally find on the station to something that is renowned really right across every Scottish regiment. And there are some very moving letters written of the way they were looked after grateful mothers and fathers saying thanks for looking after our sons, um, stories of brothers meeting who hadn't seen each other for four years, all in, all in the church hall. And it was a remarkable effort led largely by women in the congregation. And it's a story that hasn't really been told before. So our evening of words and music will be called Feeding the 50,000. And uh, we have Scottish uh, actors, David Robb, who is in Downton Abbey, uh, Gordon Kennedy uh, is another one, Isla and Claire, and Jimmy Cosmo all, all taking part in that. So put it in your diaries for October the 20th. Mm. I should also say Sir Douglas Haig was an elder at St Columbus, and his funeral procession began at St Columbus. The church was bombed in World War II and rebuilt on exactly the same site, but uh, the, church, uh, the, the coffin literally sort of lay in state, and... Obviously, Haig's reputation has been challenged since then, and that's very much part of, part of the book and our project. But at the time, he was venerated as, as having led the army and, and, and the mass crowds that turned out uh, when the funeral procession left St. Columbus. It's amazing, amazing pictures. And various other people like, also rounds like John Buchan, he was an elder as well. He gets a brief mention. <laughs> and one of the original football stars, yeah. Lord Kinnaird, who was an English superstar at football and led the FA, he was at Crown Court. He was a member or an elder, we're not sure. Yes, that's one of the things <laughs> I've got to do tomorrow's yeah. research to find out whether he's a member or an elder. But his, you mentioned, son, yeah. Sorry. his son was one, is one of the people who's on the Crown Court War Memorial and his story is told in the book. His other son, his older son, because he'd five, five sons? Six. Six. That's it's been causing us problems <laughs> recently. Nearly, nearly enough for children. a football team. Yeah. yeah. But um, his older son was also a member of the Caledonian Club and was killed in the war, and his story's in the Caledonian Club chapter of the book. But there's all these interconnections what is with it? the I same mean, one I person yeah. involved in all sorts of different well, Scottish the, the organisations. The Buchan inter interconnects as well, because he's an elder one of the churches, but also one of our rugby players who was killed was, uh, was Thomas Nelson, and many of you will know the name Thomas Nelson as a Scottish publishing firm, and Thomas Nelson was the, the son of the firm, played rugby for Scotland, played rugby for London Scottish, was a friend of John Buchan, and the 39 Steps was dedicated to Thomas Nelson by John Buchan. Um, and the, I don't have the dedication to, to, uh, to, to mind completely, but worse to the effect, uh, John Buchan writes, Dear Tommy, you and I have always enjoyed 
wildly silly, mad stories, and I've read so many of them. It's time I wrote one and dedicated it to you, and that's the 39 mm -hmm. Steps, dedicated to one of our players, yeah. but also involved in, in the church, um, and of course, um, for a time, was the uh, Minister of Information during the war. Um, so. so, any more for any more? We've got to wind up, actually, I think we've got to wind up now if the boss tells me that we have to wind up. <laughs> um, unless there's any other pressing questions, uh, I think I'll leave it at that and say, please do look at our website, scotsingreatwar.london. Yep. Uh, there are flyers. Our tent is still open to show a bit more information. There's some displays up there just across the way here. Uh, Paul and Sheena and David, I'm sure, will be around to answer questions yep. there. But I'd like to thank Paul mm -hmm. and Sheila and David for Pleasure. taking to the platform to explain what they're doing. And we hope very much you may come to some of the events uh, or buy the book, Scots in Great War London. So thank you for being a great audience and thank you very much to our panel. Thank you. Thank you.